You know, a lot of times, cats will come up to me and be like, hey, dog, what's all this young and unashamed stuff? Like, can't we just wait till we older and serve the Lord? And why you doing all this? I know it ain't the norm, man. So. me if I was saved and I would say yes of course I'm saved I've been saved since a tender young age of six or maybe it was eight I can't even remember when it was that it happened man I guess that's because it never really happened and all the while I was just acting but how could that possibly be because I clearly recall being submerged in what seemed like a deep blue sea and it kind of frightened me I mean the pastor had even said in the name of the father the son and the holy ghost amen and everything I vividly recollect the freezing cold as it painfully pierced through my every bone. But as far as I know, not a single thing was changed within my soul. They say that baptism is a symbol of having turned away from those things of old, but I guess I was just too young to know. I mean, I knew there was a man named Jesus who once died on the cross to save and quote unquote loss, but I never gave that much thought. I knew he died and rose again to save us from our sins, but that's pretty much where the tale came to an end. I couldn't even comprehend where the story truly began. I could speak the name of God, but I never knew who he really was. I could proclaim the name of Christ day and night, but I never quite understood what he was capable of, let alone what it meant to be washed in his blood. After all, memorizing John 3.16 was simply like learning my ABCs and 1-2-3s, but I never knew what that really did mean. I knew the creation story and the part about Adam and Eve, but to know that the only reason I am is because God saw fit for me to be? Man, that was completely beyond me. Now because the life I was supposed to be living was at the time impossible for me to even conceive, my fleshly self began to cunningly deceive in order to appease those around me. I perfected the art of living a double life between the church girl and then the worldly me. And trust me, I had it nailed down to a T. I played it all so well you would think I deserved an Oscar. In the house of the Lord every single Sunday, but I was nothing but an imposter. Saying, Lord, Lord, sign me up. But my name never quite made it on the roster. I mean, I was the quiet one, the well-spoken one, the gifted one, the oh so intelligent one. And no one ever seemed to realize it. I was really just the lying one, the conniving one who was constantly making a mockery of the sun. And I was so naive that I actually believed. Since I had this double life down so well and no one could tell, there was no way God would send me to hell. I guess I must have missed that part in John 3.16 where it said, in order for you to receive life for all eternity, you first must actually believe. Believe. Believe in him. But to truly believe in him would mean I would actually have to turn away from my life of sin. And I wasn't ready to do that yet. Nah, not then. Because after all, I had many more years to waste. Many more years left to spit in Jesus' face. Little did I know, it would take 19 years before I would truly come to the knowledge of his saving grace. Trust, when you fail to constantly seek his face, this world can truly become a terrifying place. You see, sin brought me to places I never thought I would be, and it forced me to see things I never thought I would see. From being drunk out of my mind to being down on my knees searching for fulfillment in every little thing, seeking satisfaction in guy after guy after guy and even a few girls along the line. I was foolishly searching for joy in the sex, masturbation, and pornography. I became a slave to my own lies and vulgarity and every other iniquity that had a hold on me. And the funny thing is, in spite of all of this, I was still running around calling myself a born-again Christian, proclaiming a title I never deserved, Claiming to live according to a gospel I apparently had never really heard. Or maybe I was just ignoring it. Never realizing that I was meant to live for so much more than this. I was hypocrisy at its best. My life was nothing short of a mess. I should have surely been condemned to death. But in spite of it all, God continued to faithfully bless. It was his never-ending grace and mercy that kept me here day after day, year after year. Long enough for the truth to finally penetrate my ears. Long enough for me to realize that my life was never mine, but was always his. Now I sit here, my face covered in tears and absolute awe of how great God really is. And I praise God for finally granting me the wisdom to see what John 3.16 truly means. And it baffles me, and honestly, it should baffle you too. 
When you truly come to understand how much love God has for you, in spite of everything we continually put him through. You see in the word of God when it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, what that really means is this. For God so loved a people so sinful, so broken, so vile, so perverse, a people so unworthy like the scum of the earth, a people fully deserving of death, a people including you and me too. But instead of allowing us to receive the punishment we were by law due, God allowed his perfect, sinless, guiltless son to die on the cross just so we wouldn't have to. He gave his life so we might have life and have it more abundantly. But you see, Christ didn't just die. He was crucified after having had taken on the sins of all mankind. And consequently, he endured a separation from his heavenly father for the very first time. And that absolutely blows my mind. They mocked him and beat him and spat in his face. And so often we forget, we forget the fact that he was taken our very place. He laid down his life for the sake of the entire human race. And we ever so conveniently grow remiss and must constantly be reminded of it so we won't forget. Reminded of the reality that God demonstrated his own love for us in this. That while we were yet enslaved to sin, Christ came and died for all men. He was nailed to that cross for our sins. He was nailed to that cross for our lies. He was nailed to that cross for our pride. And judging from the way they treated him, you would think Christ had committed the worst crime, but no. He just ever so humbly, ever so lovingly, ever so selflessly stepped in as our lifeline. And it's so sad how often we use his sacrifice as a justification to continue living in our own wicked, sinful lives. And essentially we're just yelling, crucify, crucify, crucify. Wake up, people. Wake up, open your eyes and realize that Jesus Christ didn't die and rise again just so we could continue in our sin. And I'm not talking to the agnostics nor the atheists, but I'm talking to the wannabe but not gonna be born again Christians who are in vain proclaiming him. So again, I say, wake up, people. Wake up, open your eyes and please realize that Jesus Christ didn't die and rise again just so we could continue in our sin. No, he gave his life so we could repent and turn from sin, truly be born again, be renewed within and die to ourselves so we could live completely for him. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I pray that someone was blessed by it. I pray that someone is encouraged and inspired to no longer conform to the ways of this world. The whole purpose for putting all of this together was just to show that it is possible. It's possible for young people to go hard for God. It's possible for young people to truly commit their lives to Christ and their youth. It's possible for young people to stand up, stand out, and be bold for Him. And if this isn't enough evidence for you, then I encourage you to check out p4cm.com, the Passion for Christ movement, and see for yourself. Man, there are so many young people around this world who are truly going to heart for God, and I encourage you to do the same. Now, there are so many misconceptions surrounding Christianity and surrounding what it truly means to live for God. And, you know, we, we think we can't watch this movie, we can't go to this party, we can't listen to this song, we can't do this and we can't do that. And we allow those things to deter us from really committing our lives to Christ. And it's like, it's not about that. It's not about what we can't do. It's like when your eyes are truly open to the glory of God and when you truly realize how great and marvelous and wonderful and worthy He really is, it's like you don't want to be those things anymore. You don't want to. And trust me, the joy you find in Christ, the peace you find in Christ, the love you find in Christ, the fulfillment you find in Christ, man, there is nothing else like it. The world can't offer you anything that even comes close to it, and the world can never take it away. So in closing, I encourage all of you to think about one thing, to reflect on one thing. Is your life truly worthy of the gospel? Is the way you're living your life right now worth Jesus Christ dying on a cross for you, man? Is it worth it? Think about it. You know, a lot of times, cats will come up to me and be like, Hey, dog, what's all this young and unashamed stuff? Like, can't we just wait till we all just serve the Lord? And why you doing all this? I know it ain't the norm, man, so. I know cats don't understand, so. I just want to help cats understand.